talk is by John Spear, who comes from the Colorado School of Mines, which is the main center for steel research in the USA, and John Spear is one of the leaders there. He's going to talk about the quench and partitioning process, which started you know, fairly recently and has taken off all over the world. The number of papers you see and the quench and partitioning process being tried out in many different ways is really impressive. Thank you, Harry, for your kind introduction. Uh, can, it, can everyone hear, hear me okay? Okay. Um, well, it's really a great pleasure to, uh, to be here today with all of you. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to try to talk a, a little, in the short time we have, a little bit of science and a little technology. I want to uh, acknowledge my, uh, uh, my collaborators and co-authors, uh, David Edmonds, who's, who's in the room here. Um, I, our acknowledgments were supposed to be on the first slide. Um, but I thought, uh, as, I, as I thought back on the development of this concept and all the, the process, one of the great pleasures, I think, was uh, we, we often don't have the time or take the time um, to read as much as we should. But um, I did have an opportunity to, to read a, a lot of the literature from the giants. And, and that was quite an enjoyable uh, process. And I, I really want to acknowledge uh, those people who have, uh, who have influenced probably all of us in the room here. Um, and I also want to thank the many collaborators and students that um, have worked on this um, over the years. Uh, a little bit of background, um, going back to the beginning. Um, so this quenching and partitioning process was really uh, designed as a new concept to control retained austenite. Um, and the, the original process concept was that we interrupt a quench. So uh, normally you would quench austenite. Um, perhaps to room temperature and form martensite, but we interrupt the quench here at a temperature where the martensitic transformation is incomplete. Um, and the idea then is some subsequent thermal treatment, either um, at the same temperature as the quenching temperature that we called one step or at some different temperature, two step, um, that uh, carbon would go from the, uh, from the martensite into the untransformed austenite and would therefore stabilize it um, so that when we then completed the quench to um, back down to room temperature, we would have more retained austenite. So that's the basic concept. Uh, we've extended that concept uh, more recently um, to the case where we may have uh, industrial processing concepts um, where the partitioning process would be non-isothermal. Um, and if we have time at the end, I might make a comment or to about that. This is a little bit more complicated, but uh, for example, in hot rolled sheet production, um, you would use the run out table cooling process to complete the uh, partial martensitic transformation. And then the coiling temperature where you wind the coil up um, would serve um, to control the, uh, basically the time and temperature, the cooling profile that would um, define the extent of partitioning. Um, so these are the sort of process concepts that we're thinking about. In the beginning, um, we started by trying to understand um, what the thermodynamics would tell us about um, what kind of carbon partitioning could happen and how it could affect the microstructure and properties of the material. And so, so this is um, some of the simple analysis from our, um, from our early papers. And uh, again, if you, if you think about uh, a metastable equilibrium between martensite and austenite. Um, carbon would uh, partition um, to this point in equilibrium. Um, in the case where we have varying non-equilibrium fractions of austenite and martensite, uh, though, if uh, we analyze this and um, if the interface is immobile, what would happen is the carbon would partition until it's uh, chemical potential is uniform in, in the two phases. That's why we have uh, not a common tangent construction, but a, um, um, a point where the, the tangent intercepts um, on the carbon axis are the same. Uh, and the interesting thing about this, then, is depending on the phase fractions, um, we could have mul multiple different conditions where the carbon potentials are equal in the phases. Um, and so we could have very carbon-enriched austenite much more than um, at equilibrium or, or less carbon enriched austenite. So uh, depending on the phase fractions, we could have some interesting carbon enrichments. Um, and that went into the early development. And then the next step of the process was try to try to understand uh, 
um, how we would control microstructure. And in that, that regard, this is an important um, uh, diagram from our early literature, and so I want to just walk you through it um, for a moment. So if we think about uh, quenching austenite, um, so once the quench temperature goes below the martensite start temperature, um, the amount of austenite that remains is diminishing. The amount of martensite that forms during the quenching is increasing with undercooling. Uh, and then, so we stop at that quench temperature, and then we partition the carbon, and, and most of the carbon would like to partition um, uh, back into the austenite. And so depending on how much austenite and martensite are present, that defines the amount of carbon that can uh, partition into the austenite. Um, and so, so this line right here tells you the carbon concentration of the austenite if the martensite gives up all its carbon um, to, uh, to that austenite. Uh, and so if we have a lot of martensite and just a little bit of austenite, the carbon enrichment of that austenite is very great and uh, diminishes with, um, with reduced martensite content and increased austenite. Um, and so, 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 so this tells you about the stability of the austenite at the quench temperature after partitioning before we go through the final quench to room temperature. And then depending on that stability, this line tells you how much of that austenite that existed um, after partitioning will remain um, after final quenching. So, so, so this is the amount of that austenite that transforms to uh, new martensite. And so if we s subtract that from the austenite that was present at the quench temperature, uh, we get this red line. And that's the end result of this um, that tells us how much austenite we could retain at room temperature. And so this functional behavior was very important, helping to guide um, our, our processing histories as we tried to verify that this concept would work. So we have this peak uh, in the behavior associated with particular quenching temperatures. Um, embedded in this um, fairly simple model were some assumptions that are, are pretty important from a physical metallurgy standpoint. Um, first of all, that we had ideal partitioning, right? All the carbon would like to go uh, into the austenite. Um, that we've completely suppressed the precipitation of carbides um, or conventional tempering reactions. Um, that the, once you form the martensite during quenching, that uh, you don't change the phase fractions anymore. That is, that the, the interfaces are immobile. Um, and that the austenite doesn't decompose in other ways, like bainite formation. So um, there have been um, these assumptions are not always correct, um, and so they're the source of a lot of interesting um, follow-up that we can do as a metallurgical community. Um, but still, the model is very helpful to guide us. Now, uh, this particular uh, model that I described here was actually applied more recently um, in a completely different class of steels, the so-called medium manganese steels, that are um, very fine-grained uh, intercritically annealed material, so fine uh, ferrite austenite mixtures um, where the austenite is really stabilized by high manganese concentrations. Um, and I'll just show you how this um, diagram was applied in that case. It's basically the, the same kind of uh, behavior, except in this case, the, um, the ferrite austenite fraction is controlled by the annealing temperature. Um, so the greater is the annealing temperature, the more austenite we have. Uh, and then if manganese can partition, partition into that austenite, um, the austenite is enriched with manganese, but um, it really depends on the phase fraction. So, uh, so the more austenite that you have, the less manganese enrichment that you have. Uh, and so the less stable is that austenite um, in terms of uh, remaining at room temperature. And so uh, depending on its stability, could transform to martensite during the final quenching. If we again subtract this from the austenite curve, uh, we end up with this black and blue function that tells us how much austenite would re remain at room temperature. So a, a, a very similar um, application of the same fundamentals to a completely different class of steels. Um, and uh, this is actually how it worked out. So this is a seven manganese, I think uh, 0.1 carbon steel. Uh, this is the predicted austenite fraction as a function of annealing temperature. 
Uh, again, assuming full manganese partitioning between the phases. Uh, this was a long annealing time. Uh, and these are the experimental data showing that uh, this, this model was helpful to understand uh, the behavior of this other class of materials. So it's a, it's a very exciting time in steel development now. I think um, uh, I'll go on the record as saying this might be one of the most exciting times for steel development ever. Um, the, uh, in the automotive community, the, um, the need for increased fuel economy is dramatic. And at least in the United States, there's, uh, there's a tremendous need for steel development to uh, reduce weight um, and uh, enhance vehicle performance or maintain vehicle performance. Um, so in terms of application of quenching and partitioning, um, the automotive industry right now is driving that um, interest in application. But there are other uh, interests in, in ball bearings and high toughness plate steels. Um, so there's, there's much opportunity that hasn't been explored yet in quenching and partitioning. Um, but in the automotive industry, so we saw this so-called uh, banana diagram before, where we have this range of uh, tensile ductilities and tensile strength um, for a whole variety of different kinds of um, steel materials. And I heard this described uh, interestingly very recently by Anil Sachdev of General Motors as the miracle of steel. So, so we look at this somewhat mundanely as, uh, as experts in steel, um, but the fact is by small variations in composition and processing, we can create this tremendous window of, uh, of different steel products with very different properties, so the miracle of steel. Uh, but we're trying, to push, we're trying to push the properties up into higher strengths and higher ductilities. Um, so that's very challenging and, and yet very exciting um, for the community. Um, how are we going to get there? Um, so this is, a, um, this is a simple model developed by my colleague David Matlock, um, really looking at composite models for uh, predicting uniform ductility based on phase properties. And, and you can see if we... If we look at combinations of ferrite and martensite, we get property combinations that you would expect um, that, that are fairly parallel to the different grades on the banana diagram, so ferrite by steels. Uh, if instead we, uh, we look at combinations of a particular uh, stable austenite mixed with martensite, um, we get much better strength ductility combinations in this um, future need area uh, of steels. And, and actually, if instead of using stable austenite, uh, we can control the austenite stability. I, I don't think we really know how to tune the austenite stability in practice as well as we would like to, uh, but we can, we can move this curve around as well, and so it's a very interesting opportunity. Um, but in terms of how we get to the future, our philosophy in automotive steel development is pretty much uh, we need to have uh, retained austenite in the microstructure. And so, so that's driving interest in Q&P steels, uh, in carbide-free bainite steels, in medium manganese steels, as I mentioned. Um, so very exciting time. Um, there are a number of things on this slide that, that I want to mention. Um, first of all, this is all, um, this data is all experimental data from quench and partition steels. Um, and some of the people who generated it are, are in the room here. Um, and this green um, shaded region over here, this represents the original target that we set out to achieve uh, in 2003. And so we were pretty happy that, that our development was fairly successful in getting us um, um, high strength materials with, uh, with quite good ductility. Um, the dashed line and the solid line here are the same predicted curves that I showed on the last slide. Um, so we were quite happy, but what's happened in the meantime um, is that the property targets um, keep getting more challenging. Um, so uh, one of the large automotive companies in 2010 defined a target up here, which is way up in the, in the future uh, band of desired properties, and then uh, the next year um, put some targets up here. The United States uh, Department of Energy has funded a integrated computational materials engineering program with the industry. Um, and they've set some even greater targets um, than the industry has set. So, so when we think about how successful we are in meeting property targets, we also have to re recognize that the, um, the challenge is increasing. Um, so the targets are moving. Um, I promise 
Uh, this is my last banana diagram for this presentation. Um, our original models uh, looked at transformation behavior and um, subsequent models looked, uh, incorporated some partitioning kinetics. And so these are some Dictra models. Uh, you can see that um, the ferrite gives up its carbon rather quickly. Um, it takes longer to uh, equilibrate the austenite. Um, so what's interesting about that is that um, under certain partitioning scenarios, um, the austenite might uh, contain most of the carbon, but with a non-uniform chemical composition gradient. Uh, we get some, some interesting effects then when we try to understand the stability of that austenite. So we calculate it using the Koisten and Mar Marburg equation locally. Um, but in fact, we don't know how good that assumption is. So, so one of the questions for the community then um, is what is the stability of austenite um, in, uh, in the case where we have a local concentration gradient that's on the same scale um, as the martensite microstructure. Um, these are some examples. So quenching partitioning um, has been applied now in commercial steels, um, first by Bao Steel in China. These are commercial applications. Um, there are other companies uh, around the world, though, who I, I believe have a, uh, a, a real interest in uh, considering this technology. Um, so in the, in the few minutes that, uh, that remain for my presentation, I thought I'd uh, present some curiosities, challenges, and opportunities. So um, we, we've learned a lot over the last uh, 10 years, but there's still a lot of things that uh, we don't understand, and hopefully this community uh, will come back at some future time and, uh, and help. So, here are uh, Q&P um, property data. So this is the product of tensile strength and elongation versus the amount of retained austenite. Um, and so our, our desire was to produce high amounts of retained austenite. But you can see from this diagram that, in fact, um, the properties are not highly correlated with the fraction of retained austenite. So I think that we still don't completely understand uh, what controls the work hardening behavior uh, and the property combinations in these steels. Um, we've looked a lot at partitioning mechanisms and some of the physical metallurgy and uh, the, the group at Leeds has, has led us in this regard. Um, one of the questions is about carbide precipitation, uh, which generally speaking we don't want because it takes carbon from the microstructure that we would otherwise use for uh, austenite stabilization. Um, I'm showing a, a particular steel that's um, partitioned at two different temperatures. In one case, uh, we get a lot of uh, epsilon transition carbides in the microstructure. In the other case, uh, at higher temperature, um, we get austenite stabilization. Um, so for the community, I think one of the challenges then is um, how do we control the stability of transition carbides other than perhaps temperature according to uh, the models that we think we understand. Um, but if we could uh, turn on and turn off um, transition carbide formation using uh, other means than we understand now, it would be a powerful alloy design tool. Um, the, last, the last comment I want to make, we've had a, a lot of uh, discussion about whether the, the uh, martensite austenite interface is stationary um, or mobile. Um, there's been in some interesting modeling work that's been done at, at Delft in particular. Uh, one of my uh, former students, Grant Thomas, uh, looked at some higher alloyed steels, not, not intended for commercial applications, um, but intended to study the partitioning mechanisms. And uh, one of the things that we looked at is the uh, change in the austenite fraction during partitioning um, in these um, steels where austenite, you could quench to room temperature and then partition subsequently. Um, in, in a um, high nickel containing steel, we found that the austenite fraction was stable. It did enrich in carbon. Um, so the, the assumption of a stationary interface was pretty good. In the case of a high manganese steel, though, we actually um, increased the austenite fraction during partitioning. So, so um, clearly, we think the interface was not immobile. Um, EBSD results, um, so the green is the austenite phase. The, the change from left to right is with partitioning. And you can see, um, again, nickel steel increase in austenite fraction, nickel steel approximately constant austenite fraction. And um, 
some inverse pole figure um, diagrams really looking at what happens to the microstructure during partitioning. Uh, this, is, um, this is in the manganese steel. Um, these colors represent austenite orientations, and so um, these we think are probably the original austenite grain orientations, um, confirming that we, we think the austenite is growing during partitioning um, rather than nucleating. So, but we don't completely understand why that happens in one steel and not another. I think I'll, I'll bypass this slide and um, go to the conclusion. Um, quenching and partitioning science and technology continues to advance. Um, the process has been commercialized and, and hopefully there will be other applications um, besides automotive sheet steels and growth in those applications. Um, but challenges and opportunities remain um, both in terms of science as well as in technology. And, and I end in closing here showing some QNP microstructures. This is one that we obtained in the laboratory, intercritically annealed, so we have ferrite here. This is actually a commercially produced QNP steel. Um, and uh, then we have a mixture of uh, austenite and, and thick, uh, excuse me, of martensite and thick austenite films. So with that, I conclude my presentation. And again, thank you uh, to be here. Thank you very much, uh, John, for creating one of the modern concepts of uh, automotive steels. Uh, very interesting talk. We are open for questions. Uh, very short question. In fact, you mentioned that bainite is something that we don't want in QNP steels. But could you comment a little bit more about that? I, I understand that we don't want bainite because it takes part of the carbon. Well, From the viewpoint of mechanical properties, I expect that maybe people should go in this direction to start combining some bainite with, yeah, could you? So I don't remember saying that you don't want bainite, um, but, but I think that um, when, 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 when bainite forms from the, from the austenite, at the partitioning temperature, then you really have a mixed microstructure. So you have a QNP mechanism, um, but you also have a you know loss tempering bainite formation mechanism. So you get a mixed microstructure, and I think there are um, there are some uh, interesting properties that people are getting uh, in cases where they do have those kinds of mixed microstructures, so hybrid mechanisms. So I think they they might actually be fairly important industrially. Um, so, yes. Thanks, it's a very nice talk. Uh, you mentioned these uh, medium manganese steels. That's a probably a very hot topic at the moment. And apart from manganese, uh, what's your opinion on the range of uh, other elements, such like uh, aluminum or silicon? Um, well, I think there are some um, Aluminum and silicon wouldn't be strong austenite stabilizers, so you'd be looking at different concepts uh, with those elements. So, so manganese is interesting because it allows us to really increase the, aust the retained austenite fractions to quite high levels. Um, there are some other interesting concepts, particularly with high aluminum, um, where aluminum is being used to uh, reduce the density of the steel. So um, those are different concepts that are a little bit outside the scope of the design concepts that I discussed today, but, um, but are also of considerable interest right now. Uh, okay, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the, the results from Thomas uh, on the high nickel and high manganese steels, uh, in which uh, he uh, observes uh, an increase in the fraction of austenite with the partitioning, uh, uh, during the partitioning step. And uh, I wonder if, uh, I know that at those temperatures, the, the, the diffusion of manganese is extremely small, but I also saw some articles from another uh, researchers in which they uh, think that the diffusion of manganese is uh, underestimated at low temperatures. So do you think this uh, increase in the austenite fraction can be due to some manganese partitioning, actually? Um, so I don't. I don't know the answer to that exactly. This is a, I mean, this is a very low temperature to be thinking about. Yeah, um, I, I know. To be thinking about manganese partitioning, but I, I do agree, um, not not necessarily in this temperature regime, but 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 actually in the temperature regime of annealing, uh, 
of the medium manganese steels, so in the intercritical regime, um, we're getting much more manganese partitioning than you would expect from the sort of published um, diffusivity data. So, so I agree that manganese diffusion um, seems to be much faster than, than we thought it was. I don't know that that's I don't know that that's a contributor to the temperatures that Grant Thomas was looking at here, though. Because it's interesting, uh, when you have lower manganese levels, you, is, you don't see those, uh, or I, at least uh, we don't observe uh, such an increase in the fraction of ozonite, but uh, at those uh, levels it's observed, so that's maybe related, but... Yeah, it, so what's happening in the nickel steel then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Okay, thank you. We, we have a question yeah. from... The rest uh, of the world. Nata Steel from Netherlands, uh, they have a question. Okay. Um, the question is, um, if, if the intercritical annealing temperature has been done in, say, 800 to 900, is it possible for the manganese to partition in, say, 100 seconds? That's the question. Um, so, so, are we talking about a medium manganese steel? I guess so. So I, I guess it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, but I, I, think, I think there's some data in the recent literature that shows that you could get significant uh, manganese partitioning um, at intercritical temperatures in relatively short times. Uh, another question from uh, AK Steel. Um, is it possible for manganese carbon interaction is different compared to carbon interaction to nickel affect this? Uh, okay, so, so this, um, this author is actually at AK Steel, so I, I might okay. ask them to answer this. But uh, <laughs> um, So is it possible that there's a, a, a carbon-nickel interaction that's different than a carbon-manganese interaction? Um, I haven't thought about that, and um, this might not be a good venue to be thinking out loud. <laughs> John, I wonder if those unexplained experimental evidence that you saw may be related to, to carbon trap in some places that you have not mentioned and should be considered, such as dislocations, uh, twins, or other interfaces, because quenching the steel before that, that isothermal aging, you create a high dislocation densities. And and I wonder if the carbon will be really comfortable on those spaces before partitioning to the austenite. Then maybe you are losing carbon in the process of uh, carbon partitioning that uh, cannot rule out the carbon balance that you are considering for the, retain for the way of retaining your austenite at room temperature at the end. And also what we have observed in carbide-free bionitic steels is that uh, for subsequent uh, low temperature tempering that uh, at around the temperature that we get the, the um, uh, epsilon carbides that you mentioned before, those uh, dislocations segregated in carbon can be a key issue because with time and temperature, uh, cultural atmospheres will evolve what we have seen in clusters, and after that, that will be the perfect nucleation site for an epsilon carbide. Then I wonder if that uh, you investigate your dislocation densities and the carbon trap of those dislocations, you can explain the appearance or not of uh, uh, epsilon carbide or more or less retaining austenite at the end in your microstructure. So that was a complicated question, but... Um, <laughs> But I, 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 think, uh, I think part of the core of that question was, uh, what's the role of carbon trapping in Q&P? Um, and I, I, think, um, I think carbon trapping should be important. And we've, we've seen a lot of, when we have done carbon balances, we have seen instances um, where uh, we're obviously not getting all the carbon out into the austenite. So, um, and, you know, if we could, if we could reach the kinds of carbon enrichments that we predict from our thermodynamics, that is, if we could turn off the competing mechanisms, we could really get some interesting carbon enrichment. So carbon trapping is part of that. 
Um, although, in order to study that, we've done some atom probe, but to study it, you also have to understand the tempering reaction and carbide precipitation, so that's all um, challenging, and we, we, we haven't completed that kind of work yet. Yeah, uh, according to your Dijkstra calculation, the diffusion of carbon is uh, still slow, and the diffusion distance is limited. Is there any uh, desirable size of uh, retained austenite, and uh, how, how can it control the size of the retained austenite? So, so how do we control the size of the retained austenite? Well, the maybe, aust maybe the size should be limited to stabilize the retained austenite. Um, so, so we haven't studied uh, experimentally ourselves yet um, the influence of, uh, of, the aust of the starting austenite grain size uh, and morphology extensively. But I have heard that there are some people who are working on some microalloid versions of, of quenching and partitioning where they've maybe refined the austenite and, and uh, gotten some better mechanical properties. Right. The, the size of retained austenite between the mountain side. Right. But, but we really, once you, do, once you make the austenite and then quench it, so then the austenite size and, and morphology is controlled at that point, and you're moving the carbon around. Uh, carbon moves you know, ra rather fast, so you can decarburize the, the martensite pretty quickly. Um, but if you want to change the austenite um, size and morphology, you need to change the starting microstructure then. Um, and that part we haven't um, gotten to yet. Yeah, in the video of manganese uh, steel, you mentioned that the partitioning of manganese is quite critical to stabilize the retained austenite. But I think that there is uh, also contribution from the uh, refined grain. So uh, what do you think about that? So what's the importance of, the, of grain refinement in those yeah, steels? Right. So uh, grain refinement is going to um, help stabilize the austenite and help um, increase the strength yeah, as besides well. The, besides so the so that's, a, yeah. that's a critical um, aspect of, of the microstructure in those medium manganese steels, that you have um, very fine ferrite and austenite. Okay, thank you I agree. Very much. Thank you. Thanks, Harry.